Hello friends. Welcome to Fifth Avenue Sunday School Hour. We, for the past three weeks, have been looking at generous givers. With the thought in mind that comes from 2 Corinthians, God loves a cheerful giver. We have looked at the people generously contributing to the building of the tabernacle. Last Sunday, we spoke about the widow's might and how Jesus commended her for giving sacrificially. And this Sunday, we're going to look at the early church and their generous giving, which was a breath of fresh air to the atmosphere and the climate in the world in which they lived. So before we begin, would you pray with me? Father God, creator of all, lover of mankind, thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for teaching us in your word. And thank you that we can come to you as the living word, walking among us, making us whole, giving us new life, that we might breathe that life into the areas we live and hopefully bring your kingdom closer to earth. It's in Jesus' most precious name that we pray. Amen. We're looking this morning at Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. And this has been an inspiration to me as I've studied but I did the lesson a little bit differently than what we generally do. I do take it verse by verse, but it was like words were popcorn off the page. They just bounced across the page in front of me each time I read the scripture. There were so many things that caught my eye. So we're gonna look for particular words in scripture today as we study and see exactly what they mean and what they mean to us and how we can move forward. You will recall that the early church was under political oppression legal oppression and religious oppression they were not well thought of but the spirit of god moved that church to do mighty things and we will see that as we look at these verses and understand maybe what makes them a vibrant and joyful church and what we can learn from that as we journey through life today so Let's look at verses 32 through 37. That's Acts chapter 4. And we're going to stop along the way to see what God has to say to us. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. But they shared everything they had. Don't words just bounce off the page to you there? The first thing that caught my attention, and I read it over and over, they were of one heart and one one mind. How could that be? So different. We're all so different. Even though we're created in God's image, we are still very different. How can we be one in heart and mind? The answer is simply keep our focus on Jesus. So how do we do that? How do we keep our focus? Well, I think we have to take ourselves out of the picture and we have to look at how he would have us do things. So that might mean we need to be still and listen to God when he brings the needs of others to our mind. It may mean that we need to accept servanthood rather than trying to push our way to the top. It could mean that we need to let go of our demands and look to God for the things he wants to change in us and not be so resistant. It could mean resisting the temptation to take back those things that we've already given him and allowing him to control them and us. 
it could mean that my experiences with God won't cause spiritual growth unless they're hammered into relationships with others. And it could mean that I'm only going to grow in Christ by trusting Christ. These folks had one heart and one mind. They regarded people more important than things. They recognized they belonged to God. They recognized all they had belonged to God. They knew they were joint heirs with Christ, the risen King, and they put him first, others second, and material possessions last. So I guess being of one in one heart and mind is not a difficult concept to understand. It may be a little more difficult to implement. Does that mean we're going to always get along and feel the same way about everything? Well, no, it's not. But it does mean that with Christ in the center, we can always work for the common goal, which is to edify him and build him up. That's what it means. So let's go on to verse 433. Um, 433, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the res resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. Now, this early church lived in harmony, and there was an illustration I found this week that I thought spoke to that. A musician was walking down the street with a friend, and there was an organ grinder, and he was playing a song, and the musician recognized it. But he couldn't listen long. He clasped his hands over his ears, and he said, I've got to leave. And he swiftly walked away. In a couple weeks, the friend and the musician went to a symphony. That same song was played that the organ grinder played. The musician sat through the entirety of the song, and when it was over, he stood and applauded. I think that may be the way it is with you and me, fellow believers. When we are led by the Holy Spirit, our lifestyle is different than when we lead in our own way. And what was the topic that these early Christians shared so often and so frequently. Again, back to 33, they did it with great power and they continued to testify. Now this, if you read verses prior to these that we're looking at, Peter and John were incarcerated by the Sanhedrin for preaching that Jesus is the way to salvation. He's the only way to salvation. When they came out, when they were released from prison. They met together with a group of fellow believers and they prayed. They didn't pray instant prayers like we so often pray, those little popcorn prayers, boing, boing, boing. They prayed fervently for extended time. And the Holy Spirit came upon all of them in verse 31, they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And the word they spoke was the resurrection has power. Now, these are the same people, Peter and John, remember, that ran from the crucifixion to the upper room. They ran like scared cats in a dog pound. You could have called that upper room the chicken house. 
They were all so fearful. They didn't know what was going on. But even after following Christ to the cross, then they went to that empty tomb. And no one could defeat the idea that Christ had arose. He was resurrected. He was indeed alive. He walked among them. The Pharisees and the Roman soldiers couldn't dispute it. They didn't have a dead body in the tomb. It was empty. And this is what the early church was proclaiming. Christ is alive. He is among us. He dwells in us. And this brought them great joy because it brought them hope and it brought them promise. And they were a vibrant church. In that verse, much grace was upon them all. I don't know about you, you probably like I was, brought up with the idea that grace is unmerited favor, and I agree wholeheartedly it is, just didn't give me a lot to sink my teeth into. But Stuart and Jill Briscoe share a story about when their son Pete was younger. Pete was a little mischievous, and he got into some trouble, and he had to be punished for it. He had to be reprimanded, and Stuart said to Pete, that deserves 10 whacks with this wooden spoon. Wouldn't you agree? And little Pete said, yes, Dad, I guess so. One, two, three, all the way to eight whacks. And Dad stopped. And little Pete sniffed back the tears and he said, Dad, there are two more. And Dad said, no. Son, that's mercy. Not getting what you deserve. Now go to your room. You're grounded. The little boy went off to his room. And he'd been there only a half an hour when Dad called up the steps and said, Pete, Want to go for ice cream? I'm paying. Pete came flying out of his room and he said, Yes, Dad, but I thought I was grounded. And Dad said, Son, that's grace. Not getting the punishment you deserve, but getting a free gift instead. That makes grace understandable the free gift given to you and me because Jesus cared enough to go to the cross for us now as we move forward let's look at 34 through 35 there were no needy persons among them from time to time those who owned lands or houses sold them brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles feet and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. What stands out to you there? There were no needy persons. There were no needy persons because the church attended to the needs of the people. Now they didn't sell all they had or everyone would have nothing. They sold the things that they owned and the houses that they had and brought the money from those sales to lay at the apostles' feet. And the apostles were the ones who distributed the goods. And I think it's in First Thessalonians we see that people began to take advantage of that and there are some guidelines and restrictions so as not to have that happen. But that's not part of our lesson today, so I'm going to leave that for you to look up and to find on your own, if you're interested. It was distributed to anyone who had a need. And this brought to mind, I remember as a little girl, my dad would come home from work, and mom was noted for her hot rolls. 
And she always had hot rolls on the stove, and he'd say to them, to her, are these hot rolls for us, or are they for somebody else? She loved to give them away, and people loved to receive them. And he would go down the street with his little pan of rolls to various neighbors. And it soon came to the point that mom and dad didn't have to go down the street with their pan of rolls. The neighbors came to us every evening at mealtime. We had visitors and all they wanted was hot rolls. Their needs were met. We fellowshiped, we had a good time and we made great memories. Are you a giver? or a getter. Which are you? We need to be givers. Joseph, in verse 36, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, not all of us can be like Peter and John. But we can be like Barnabas. We can be encouragers. Each of us has that gift. Barnabas was a Levite. And Numbers 18.20 tells us that Levites were not to have any land. So I don't know where Barnabas got this land. Whether he inherited it, I don't know. But I know that he gave it. That was all he had. And he trusted God with it. So that the needs of his people could be met. We need to be encouragers. We need to share the gift of compassion and love and encouragement with others. And we can all do that. Max Lucado says in his book, Facing Giants, that he was in the third phase of the triathlon when he began to lose stamina. His legs were weak. He felt dehydrated, and he said to the man alongside him, how are you doing? And the man said, this stinks. This is the worst thing I've ever done. And Max said he knew he had to move from the position he was in, or that bad thinking and attitude was going to rub off on him. So with all the strength he had, he met up with a 66-year-old grandmom. And she said, you look weary. Don't forget, you're gonna finish this race. Stay hydrated, keep the faith. You're gonna win this thing. And she moved forward. And with that encouragement, Max was able to move forward too. I don't think he won the race, but he was able to move forward with just a little bit of encouragement. And so it is with the church. The church in every generation is supposed to be where people can come to get a breath of fresh air. A place where people can go to plug into community where people genuine, genuinely love God and love one another. Church is a place where grace is the antidote in this poison world we live in. Our calling is not nearly as complicated as we make it. Freely we have, freely we give. Can't we be like the first church they were Easter people. Their motto, what happens to you matters to me. They received the hope, the freedom, and the joy of the resurrection. And they translated it into personal practice and practical acts of sacrifice and kindness. That's Jesus' way. And that's the calling of the church. Barnabas' name was Joseph. His friends changed Joseph to Barnabas, which meant encourager. 
If someone chose a name for you in Christ today, what would that name be? Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for teaching us the way to live. Help us to be wise and follow. Lord, we want to be Easter people. Help us step outside of ourselves to become engaged in the lives of others that your love might go forth. For it's in Jesus' precious and holy name that I pray. Amen. Have a good week, dear friends. May you receive blessings abundant and share them with others.